to kick start anything. Um, what really helps is if you kind of line up your instruments with kind of the order that you're going to be using them. This is how we do it in a private practice. So right now, I just usually will take out those straight instruments. This is the syringe, obviously. This is called a uh, Minnesota retractor, cheek retractor, bite block. Um, for most um, adult patients, we do use the smaller bite block if they have teeth. If it's an edentulous patient, you can use the larger bite block. And then the surgical section obviously goes into your section. So to get started, these are all pretty self-explanatory. Blade handle, periosteal elevator that starts to, after you've had the patient numb, you always put in a throat pack. I do not have four by fours out here, but four by fours or four by four gauze are always part of your surgical setup. We never use two by twos back here in oral surgery, nor do we use a short yellow needle. It's always the long blue that we use. So you've got the patient numb, you put the bite block in, you put the gauze pack in, then if you have to have a flap, you've got your blade handle and a 15, 15 blade. And um, then the flap is made. And I'm gonna kind of go back here and show how I do a, a throat pack. I usually fold it into a triangle and kind of tuck the ends in a little bit. And then if this was a mouth, I kind of keep that pointed tip up at the palate and I hold that part with my suction tip as I'm tucking that down into the teeth. I know that's a little confusing, but the reason why I keep this pointed part up is because if you put a, this in this way, the palate is has more of an opening up there. So that's why I always try to keep it a little more covered up with the pointed end up. Okay, so we've made um, our flap. Um, now that tissue needs to be taken away. And that's when there's a couple of different instruments that can be used for that to kind of get the tissue back. Um, you can use the molt, um, yeah. or a two or a four molt. Um, some attendings, you can see the tip of them a little different, the round and the tips. So what you're trying to do is just get that tissue back away from the tooth to get the exposure on it. So once you've got the tooth exposed from using these, then you need to go in and start releasing the periodontal lig ligament. And the instruments used to do this is this is called a periotome. Do you want to get outside so we can see how it curves? Yeah, there we go. Can you see it? Yeah. And show them this. It's a flexible periotome. So there's a give to this. And so this starts, you start putting this into the tooth, you know, straight up and go around and just work it around like this. At first, you're not going to be able to get it very far but just keep working around the tooth. And then, you know, each time you're getting it down a little bit farther to release the periodontal ligament. So sometimes then you can go in and this is called um, a luxator. And it also is to be used this way to the tooth, horizontal to the tooth. And so you can put this down in that space and also use it the same as the periotone. It's just a little sturdier and you can get down a little bit farther to just work around and try to release that tooth. Now, after you've done that, then we have a couple of straight instruments that are called, you know, the straight elevators. And there's a small and a large. And then this one is curved. Okay, go on. And so start out now, and this goes in between the teeth, if you've got teeth to, um, you know, elevate against. But you never want to do it up high, especially if you've got a crown on the tooth, on the extraction tooth or the adjacent teeth, because that will loosen it. So you always want to try to get as low down as you can to start elevating. And, you know, this is how you use the elevator. Then you just, this is a little bit bigger. So it just gives you a little bit more space. So you should start seeing some pretty good movement at this point in time on a tooth if you're doing all the steps correctly. This is just another little variation. It's curved and it has little tiny teeth that you can just barely feel with your finger now. And so I don't even think it'll pick up on there. Mm -hmm. But there's just little tiny serrations that sometimes just give you that extra little oomph to be able to um, elevate that teeth out. Now, once you've got pretty good movement, now you're ready for a forcep. And I'm just going to kind of roll these over so we can get the different forceps out here. So these are the three most common forceps that we use back here. 
the upper universal, which is a 150, a lower universal, which is a 151. And I'll show you a really slick way to get this. And then this is a number 23, but we call it a lower cow horn for obvious reasons. You can kind of see how that is, um, got, you know, the tips like that. And that goes into the frication. This is a lower molar um, forcep, and this goes into, you get that into the frication, buckle and lingually. And then as, you know, you kind of start out sometimes like this, and then as you slowly put more pressure and kind of back and forth with it to really get those, the beak into the frication farther and farther, this will actually help lift the tooth out as it gets closer together. So a really easy way to tell the upper forcep from the lower forcep by just glancing at it. And this is very kindergarten, but it's never failed me. So the upper forcep is more flat on the top. The lower forcep has more of an angle on it. So I just think of like an L, you know, so that angle is lower. So when it's sitting there, when you see that, it's like, okay, that's the lower one. So you just don't even have to think about it. You can just grab lower, lower universal or a lower cow horn for molars. So um, basically, if you've done all of your strain instruments correctly, your forcep is really just kind of holding the tooth while it comes out. You're not brute force trying to get it out because you've done all the preparation by using your strain instruments correctly. So if you get it out and it doesn't, you know, it's just kind of sitting there, then you can grab um, the hemostat to get it out or um, some students will use the ronger, but would rather you not. But it's just another thing to try to get a hold of it. Now, if by chance you've done all the necessary steps and you've still had a crown break off from the roots, then you have to go in and usually use um, a handpiece to remove some bone. You always, so if you don't have a flap up to this point, then you always usually need to make a flap. So if it's just been a simple extraction that you just started out and um, you were just going along and then the crown broke off and now you have to use a handpiece a flap has to get that tissue out of the way. So we usually have you start taking off um, buckle bone. You never go around to the lingual with your handpiece. It's buckle bone, a little to the distal, a little to the mesial. Um, just, you know, you don't just go diving down minimal amount of bone. Then you can start sometimes by getting back in with your small elevator to maybe get some movement on it. Or we have these root picks that are right and left root pick. And so obviously, you know, depending on where you're at in the mouth, and this is very sharp pointed. And so it can kind of really get in there on those smaller spaces and kind of lift that tooth up. If it's an upper molar, just stop if the roots have broken off. Stop and um, until you get a little more experience behind you, just kind of get an attending because upper molars can end up in this upper molar root tips can end up in the sinus very, very easily if you don't know what you're doing. So that's why you really just stop if it's not just a routine, simple extraction that you've been able to get out. But if the root has kind of came apart from the crown, just stop and get some help at this point in time. Okay, so now we've got the tooth out and everything's cleaned up very nicely. You use your curette, the blended curette. To clean everything out very nicely, we will have you irrigate out the socket with some chlorhexidine and just a monojet syringe, and we'll give you that. And so now you're ready to start to suture. And I'm just gonna move these out of the way so you can kind of see. Oh, back up. Before you suture, you kind of go in there and the very best way to find out if you've got sharp edges or anything is to use your gloved finger. Go in and really go around that socket. If there's any little sharp edges or anything, it will catch your glove very easily. And um, we tell the students to kind of do it first, you know, with just bone on bone to kind of see how it feels. Then, um, if you've made a flap, kind of put your flap back in place and feel it with the tissue back in place. And so if you find a little sharp bone that's poking out, um, it's best to get that out at extraction time because everything will heal up better. So that's when you use, this is called a rongeur, and it has an end cutting. It's, it's end cutting. So it's kind of like a glorified fingernail file. You know, it can just go in and get the very little ends of any of the socket sharp edges. And then this is called a bone file and it has a larger and a smaller end. And so this, and I mean, you have to use some pretty good force on this. And so it, you just try to smooth out if you've used the wrong gear. Sometimes you can just use this if it's just a little tiny um, spot sticking up. 
You do that, very good. Then feel again. Have your assistant feel. Sometimes, you know, your finger doesn't pick up everything. Just have them say, hey, just feel this and see if it's smooth. And so then, now you're ready to um, suture. So here's the needle holder. And um, the scissors for that. Some kids like to start out by using um, an Adson. It's just a little tissue for set to kind of hold the tissue as they're, I don't have a needle on here, but it kind of just holds it as they can get the needle. The best thing you can do is come back and practice on the suture boards to try to get a little more, just become more adept at suturing because sometimes it takes some students as long to suture as it did for them to take out the tube. And so that's something that the only way you can do it is just practice, practice, practice. You don't just start out knowing how to do it fast. We have plenty of things back here for you to work on. We have a video you can watch. And so um, after you've sutured, you've you know had the sutures trimmed, then you're ready for a gauze pack to put in the patient's mouth. And let me show you the easiest way. So you've got your four by four pack. I fold it into thirds. And what I'm trying to do is get as many layers for it to be absorbent. So if you put it in a patient's mouth and send them out, that's not as absorbent. Plus it's sticking out of their mouth. They hate it. They can't get, you know, good pressure on it. So I get it to this point. I use my air water, moisten it just a tiny bit. I don't want it saturated with water. And then I start rolling it up just like a nice little cotton roll. And you can see by doing this, how many more layers I'm getting in there that they can actually put in. And so number one, it's a smaller thing. When you go in there, when they bite down, it's a little bit taller. So it puts more pressure on automatically. And just because there's so many layers, it is just a better throw pack than just folding it up and sticking these big gauze things in like this. So that's it.